What's up, everybody? Welcome back to the Next Deal Podcast. As always, I'm your host, Justin Dossi, joined by Vince Hall. Today, we have a very special guest, Jay Connor, who has been involved in real estate since 2003, uh, focuses a lot of his time and energy on raising private money. And one thing that I really like that you put on here is that your average profit per deal is over $80,000, which... I have questions around that because I need to figure out how to get there. <laughs> <Right. too. laughs> uh, but super excited to have you on here, Jay. How are you doing today? Justin, I am doing amazing. Having a wonderful day here in Eastern North Carolina in our little teeny tiny town called Moorhead City, North Carolina. That's got a population of 8,000. Our total target market has only got 40,000 people in it. And the reason I share that is, you know, you don't have to be in a big market to make a lot of money and serve and impact a lot of people. Yeah. Couldn't so agree true. more. Yeah. That's awesome. We've got some friends in some smaller markets too. Not as, I don't think as small as that, but definitely some smaller markets that do some really, really good deals and make a lot of money as well. Awesome. How, uh, just kind of get started. How did you, how did you get started in real estate? Like what was the... The, the reasoning to, to jump into this. Yeah. Well, I was actually raised in, um, in an environment of helping people own a home as far back as I can remember. My dad, Wallace Connor, who by the way is still living and is 91 and a half years old. He always nice. makes sure you remember the, the half. Yeah, remember he's the still half. doing deals. <laughs> He, uh, at 91 years old, he is, uh, developing a 350 house, uh, new development right now. That's halfway built out. Wow. Um, he, he just, uh, emailed me yesterday. My 91 year old dad is emailing me. He emailed <laughs> me yesterday, the contract, uh, that he's selling land to uh, Dunkin Donuts. He's negotiating with a bowling alley company and he's got a letter of intent last week from a hotel chain, all this <laughs> at 91 years old. Wow. Anyway, That's amazing. And I'm not involved in any of that stuff. I said, dad, don't you leave none of that mess for me to finish up before you croak and kick the bucket. <laughs> you need yeah. to finish all that stuff. <laughs> anyway, he, my dad was the largest, his company was the largest retailer of mobile homes, manufactured housing, mm -hmm. trailers, whatever you want to call them. Um, uh, you know, decades ago. And so I was raised in that environment of affordable housing. Now, when I was 11 years old, I started, uh, he had an acceptance corporation where he did the financing for, uh, buyers of his mobile homes, manufactured homes. And so at 11 years old in the summertime, I started calling up people's landlords and employers and checking people's credit. That's before credit scores were even uh, invented. <laughs> and so I was, I was like, you know, immersed in this business world starting at 11 years old. And I worked with my dad. Uh, well, I went to Wake Forest University. Then I went in the restaurant business for a couple of years. But then I came to work with him in the mobile home business. And I did that for a long time. Well, in the early 2000s, the financing for the product went away. The whole industry, the whole manufactured housing, mobile home industry fell out of favor with Wall Street and they just stopped financing the product because there were so many, you know, uh, foreclosures and, and defaults. So I knew if I ever got out of mobile homes, I wanted to get into single family houses. And here's why. You know, the average profit on a single wide was about $3,000 back then. And I had friends that were flipping houses. This was prior to the fake HGTV show, um, <laughs> uh, uh, you know, that were making, yeah, I mean, making $30,000 um, on, on a flip. And I said, I like the sound of 30000 better than 3000 So in 2003, uh, that's when my wife, Carol Joy, and I started in this uh, and started investing in single family houses. Uh, you know, we, we buy and hold some, but most of them we flip, we rehabbed and renovated over 500 of these single family wow. houses now over this period of time in our small population area. Um, and as you mentioned, uh, in the intro, our average profit per deal now is $82,000 per flip. And I don't say that to brag. The reason I've mentioned that is because again, you don't have to be in a big market to make, you know, significant, you know, profit per deal. Yeah. Um, 
And we don't do that. I mean, I'm not like, a, I'm not a whole, I've never wholesaled a deal in my life. I mean, I know how to wholesale a deal, but I ain't got nobody to wholesale it to. Like I'm it, right? I yeah. like being a big fish in a small pond. And so we'll do two or three deals a month, right? We average 30 deals a year um, with, with those average profits. So, you know, with, with those average profits, the, 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 the money, you know, I mean, that math makes sense. Yeah. And I've got an amazing team, got an amazing team. I've got the same acquisitionist that's been negotiating with my sellers of FISBOs for sale by owners for 18 years. Um, got the same contracting crew for 15 years. I got the same realtor for 19 years. I got the same real estate attorney firm since I started. So I just have an amazing team that the business really runs on automatic and I'm in mm -hmm. it, you know, maybe five to 10 hours a week. Yeah. And I would say you're pretty well known in your, in your community. I take it then as well. Well, yeah. I mean, I grew up here, yeah. right? I mean, this is where I'm originally from. Um, Carol Joy and I have been going to the same church here in Moorhead city, the church of Christ on Barbara road since 1988. Um, and I've, you know, I've been involved, um, been very involved in business networking international here locally, uh, rotary club, uh, locally. So we're, we're very involved in the, local community as well. And we just love serving. Yeah. I, I love that. Um, that, yeah, that attitude towards thing, uh, things of, of serving your community. So like when I started my investment business with my partner, Matt, that was one of the things that we had to agree on was, you know, the, the service aspect and really treating the people that come to us trying to sell their homes. You know, they're usually in some sort of situation that's tough. Right. Not taking advantage, um, really trying to, to be solutions driven, figure out what we can do for them, um, you know, to, to also, you know, at some point make a, a name for ourselves as well in the area. Um, you know, you mentioned you have a family member in Kirkwood here in Missouri. It's Kirkwood is a is a tough nut to crack. It's a more affluent you know, uh -huh. area. Um, and there's still a lot of really old, small houses, a lot of old money here. Um, but it's, you know, getting getting in and getting people to trust you as a business um, definitely takes some time and, and we're super eager to get there. So I love that, you know, mentality that you've had from the get go and can see that it's really proven beneficial for you. Absolutely. Well, my yeah. wife, Carol Joy and I, we decided all the way back in 2004, one year, we were one year into investing and we decided that we wanted to serve people that were facing pre foreclosure. Uh, that had had a notice of default served on them. And, you know, all these, all those people, th there's something that's, you know, gone wrong in their life or there's, or there's something that's wrong with the property, et cetera. And so we decided that we were going to serve these people in a number of different ways and not just try to go make, you know, uh, a profit on a deal. It's been my experience. Anytime I got involved in a venture or an opportunity and the only reason that I was involved was to make money. I failed miserably. I never got off square. I never got off square one. That's so true. When that, <laughs> yeah, when that <laughs> so was, true. when that was my only, you know, but being passionate and really enjoying what I'm doing and creating so many win, win, win scenarios, the, of course we're in it for the money, but not primarily. I mean, you got to have a business plan that's going to make you money. Or it's not going to last no matter no matter how much you enjoy doing it. No matter how much fun. So we yeah, yeah. Uh, so you know, uh, we decided um, how we were going to serve these people, and here's how we have all these years. First of all, we put together a what we call our foreclosure system, where we direct mail everybody that is facing pre foreclosure. So we've got an eight letter direct mail system, sequential letters that go out huh. and we, we track every foreclosure file at the local courthouse. And we've been doing that since 2004. Well, the first way we serve these people is when they respond to one of our letters. And one of the first things we do is we ask them, do you want to keep your property? Do you want to keep your house? And unfortunately, most people can't because they've got some kind of financial situation going on where they can't. But, you know, a lot of people hit bumps in the road and, you know, they, they, if they can prove to the lender that they can now make those payments, then, you know, we'll ask them, have you talked to your, first of all, have you talked to your lender? Cause most of them are, you know, floating down, you know, 
denial, yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. And, and, and not <laughs> facing, you know, what's really going on. But anyway, have you talked to your lender about a loan modification or a deferment program or whatever? And if we can give them an idea on how they can keep their property, then there's nothing in it for us directly. But, you know, I'm a firm believer in the law of reciprocity, and it's all about sowing. It's not about reaping. And if you're sowing first, you know, Zig Ziglar himself says, you help enough other people get what they need and want, you're not going to have to worry about yourself. Mm -hmm. So that's the, first, that's the first way we serve them. And then secondly, so many of these people that are facing foreclosure will sell the, their, their property to you creatively, uh, also known as buying a house subject to the existing note uh, to where you agree to make their payments and they deed you the property. Well, a lot of them will sell them to you for what they owe. And then we don't do that. We will put three, four thousand dollars in their pocket. And so, you know, if I'm averaging eighty two thousand dollars profit per deal, can I not put a few thousand dollars in their pocket yeah. to help them get back to help them get back on their feet? So we just want to make it a win, win, win scenario for everybody. I yeah. love that. That's awesome. That's something we always try and do, too, with whether if it's lenders or with it, if it's properties that we're doing, like clients we work with, whatever it might be is creating something that's sustainable long-term where everybody's winning. I make money, you make money. We're all happy. Right. And we're, we're all solving problems together. So I, I love exactly. Story. Yeah. And plus, you know, when you're in a small community, like we are, that's even more important to, uh -huh. <laughs> to make sure to make sure you got that <laughs> word travels. Absolutely. Jay, have you ever um, partnered with the seller in a renovation? Um, so, you know, I, I try to work. I, I've got a couple of deals where we can't come to a negotiation on the on the number to sell the house, right? Because they feel like it's too low or whatever. So, you know, we're trying to get a little bit creative and just saying, okay, you know, we can buy the house at this amount. We put in the rehab and we can split the profits when the house is sold. Um, to give you a little bit more money, right? Because it's a, it's a more of a win for them and it's still a win for us. Like we're still making profit. Um, have you ever done anything like that? Um, in, in your experience? No, I haven't. However, I've got some friends in uh, mastermind communities that I'm a member of that have done something similar to that and they've got a name for it. What do they call that? It's slipping my mind right now. I, I don't know. I don't know. There Novation? Might be a name for it. That's it. Novation. Okay. Novation. Yeah, so no, no, novation is a similar strategy to what you're talking about. Okay. Yeah. Um, we, we haven't, uh, implemented one yet, but we've, you know, we're in talks with a couple of people, um, about that. Um, mm -hmm. and, uh, it seems, it seems to be going in that direction that they're going to, you know, sign paperwork in that regard. Um, cool. You know, just as, yeah, just as long as all the numbers work, you know, where it's still a, a win for, you know, the seller, it's a win for obviously the contractors that are involved. It's a win for, you know, our business. It's a win for the community because it's a rehabbed house and some family is going to come in and, you know, buy that and get into a good school district. So I love, you know, all the components of it for sure. Um, sure. It's, yes. It's, it's a lot to work out. <laughs> right. Right. I imagine. Yeah. This is kind of off topic, but you mentioned a couple of the groups that you're in. Are you in Collective Genius? You know, I joined Collective Genius probably eight years ago. Okay. And uh, and Jason uh, Jason Medley, he's a very good friend, and and some of mine and Carol Joy's best friends these days uh, have come from us being in Collective Genius. Got That's it. Cool. I thought so. I was like, I know you look so familiar and I could not well, the point group, what the group it's is from. so big now. The group is so big. It is. It is. <clears throat> but I was like, because we were in it probably five years ago when everything was all combined. And I was like, I right. know I know him from somewhere and I couldn't pinpoint what it was. I bet you that's what it's from. <laughs> probably so. Probably yep. so. How, awesome. how did we originally get connected with Jay, Justin? <sighs> That's a great question. I'm not sure. I'd have to go back and check, honestly. <laughs> uh, so, someone referred us, though. I know that. Okay. Very yeah. good. Yeah. That's, it's, it's hard to remember where everyone uh, that comes on the podcast comes from because we get referrals from people. It's Facebook friends, you know, all that kind of stuff. So could have been any of those. But um, 
Awesome. Well, let, let's talk a little bit about the the private private lending side of things. You had said this before the call, um, but you have 40 something lenders that you right. never have to ask for money, right? That's and right. you have a, a large amount of capital available to you at, at any yes. given time. So let's let's talk a little bit about how how you nurture those relationships and how you kind of build that because mm-hmm. I struggle with it. I have like I have one main private lender that I work with and it's a friend of mine just happens to be very well off. Um, and, but I know some people that have 10 lenders, you know, but there's also a lot of people that struggle to even find that first person. So I'm very curious Mm. kind of what your process is and how you go about these relationships. Sure. Well, I, I got involved with private money and private lending really out of necessity from 2003, when we started investing in single family houses, and by the way, I've, you know, I've done built a shopping center from the ground up. I've done condominium developments, uh, townhomes, but my focus has been single family houses since 2003. So from 2003 until January, 2009, I relied on the local bank. That's all I knew to do. Uh, in fact, I never even heard of a hard money lender until I got cut off from the, from the banks. But anyway, for those first six years, all I knew to do was go to the local bank, get on my hands and knees, let the banker look up, you know, look at my personal assets up my skirt and pull my credit score and look at verification of income and look at financial statements and all that, all that traditional stuff. That's all I knew to do. And it worked out fine. I mean, they made the rules, but it worked out fine for the first six years until January, 2009. <laughs> I picked up my, <laughs> I yep. picked up my phone here at my office. You may find it hard to believe, but, uh, here in North Carolina, Morehead city, we still have the uh, handsets and cords that are actually attached okay. um, <laughs> here to, uh, phones. But anyway, I picked up my phone. And I called Steve. Steve was my banker. And Steve had funded a ton of deals for me those first six years. And I had two houses under contract that represented over $100,000 in profit. And they were under contract. So I thought I I still had a line of credit at the bank. Anyway, Mm. so I called him up and I told him about these two deals. And I learned like that over the phone that my line of credit had been closed with, with no notice. I said, Steve, what in the world are you telling me? You've closed my line of credit with no notice. He said, Jay, don't you know there's a global financial crisis going on right now? I said, no, but now you just gave me a global financial crisis because I can't fund these two deals that I've got under contract. And back in those days, you couldn't get your earnest money back that I'd put down. So anyway, I hung up the phone and I'm going to share a question with you and your audience. And I'm telling you this question that I asked myself will help anybody that's listening to this show with any problem you've got. I don't care if it's financial, personal health, uh, relationships, business, career, it don't matter. Here's the question that I asked myself. And that question was, I said, Jay, who do you know? It's not how. It's who, who do you know that can help you with your problem? And by the way, these people going around saying every problem is an opportunity. I want to throw up. I didn't have no opportunity. I had a problem. I couldn't fund my deals. Right? Well, when I asked myself that question, I immediately thought of Jeff Blankenship, good friend of mine and Carol Joyce. He lived in Greensboro, North Carolina at the time he was investing in single family houses. And I called him up and I told him what had happened. He said, well, Jay, welcome to the club. I said, what club is that? He said, the club of having your line of credit shut down. The bank Hmm. shut me down last week. I said, well, how are you going to fund your deals? He said, well, have you ever heard of private money? I said, no. He said, have you ever heard of self-directed IRAs and how regular people can take their retirement funds and become a private lender and make unlimited money tax-free or tax-deferred per year? I said, no, I never heard of that. Well, I studied private money very, very quickly, and I established a relationship with a self-directed IRA company to where I could refer people in my network uh, that had retirement funds and 
et cetera. So I put together what I call my private lending program. So what does that mean? I decided what ahead of time, I decided what interest rate am I going to pay? So in other words, I put on my teacher hat. Here's a big part of the secret sauce. Here's a big part of the secret <laughs> sauce. Love it. I started teaching people. I started teaching people in my own connections, what private money, what private lending is and how they can earn high rates of return safely and securely without talking about any deal. All right. In, in that initial conversation, because you see desperation has got a smell to it. And if you're talking private money, private lending, and you got a deal to be funded in that same conversation, you're coming across desperate when you don't even, you're not even trying to sound desperate. So I yeah. put on my teacher hat, you know, when you're borrowing money from the local bank, they make the rules. They set the interest rate. They set the frequency of payments. Uh, they set the underwriting criteria. They decide what's the maximum loan to value. So here's the first thing to get straight in your mind. Uh, everyone, if you're listening to this episode, the first thing to get straight, and this is a 180 degree turn in your thinking, all right? So your thinking, your, your traditional thinking is, you ask the lender for money. Your traditional thinking is you fill out an application. All that's traditional thinking. Now switch your thinking 180 degrees and guess what? The lender doesn't make the rules. You make the rules. You as the borrower, you make the rules. You set the interest rate. You're mm -hmm. making the offering. You're offering the opportunity. You decide what the maximum loan to value is, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And it's non-negotiable. This is not a this is not a negotiable conversation. Now there's three categories where you find private lenders. Those three categories are the following. Number one, your own network. Number two, your own connections. I call it your warm market. Number two is what I call your expanded network because you're going to run out of your own network sooner or later. So then how do you grow your own network very, very quickly and find and nurture new relationships? The third category of private lenders are existing private lenders, individuals, human beings that are already loaning money out. Hmm. I don't want to do business with them people because they already know the game. Hmm. They've already got in their head that they want 12%. And they know what they want. They want points. They want origination fees. And they want to set the rules. I got 47 private lenders that never heard of private money or private lending until I put on my teacher hat. And I <laughs> taught them what private money was. Look, my 47 private lenders, they don't even know what an accredited investor is, right? They don't even know what that is. Yeah. And these are, and these are ordinary people. These are people I go to church with. These are people that are school teachers. They work civil service. Uh, some of them are retired, um, you know, reg regular people, just, you know, just like you and me. And so that's a, so it's a big mind shift. It's a big change of how you're looking through the lens People ask me, they say, Jay, how do I start? I mean, how do I even start raising private money and attracting money? I say, here's how you start. First of all, you got to own the real estate between your ears before you can own any real estate out here. You want to, you want to get your thinking right. And, and so what we're doing, we're not chasing, begging, selling, persuading at all. This is not a selling proposition. That, that's one big mistake that new mm -hmm. uh, capital raisers make is they think they got to sell somebody on loaning them money and doing business with them. No, you are, you are teaching people what this is all about. And I mean, you're offering a way to make an impact, you know, in their life. Now, another mm -hmm. way that we don't ask for money is we separate. This is so important and so critical. We separate the conversation between teaching them what private money is and then having a deal or deals for them to fund. 
So again, if you're talking, so here's a writer downer right here. If you're talking about your private lending program and yeah, there you go, Vinny, write that down. If you're, <laughs> if you're, if you're talking about your private lending program and you've got a deal for them to fund, you already sound like you're pitching and selling. So what do we do? Teach them the program. Here's the, I mean, I, I pay all my private lenders the same thing. I've been paying them the same thing since 2009. And so I teach them the program. If they've got retirement funds, they may just be using investment capital, but mm -hmm. if they've got retirement funds, now I will introduce them to my preferred self-directed IRA company. And I'll introduce them to the rep there and they'll help them get their funds moved over from their existing retirement funds. If that's what they want to do. And so I teach them the program, the interest rate, how they're protected, how they can get their money back in case of an emergency, et cetera. And then they love the program. They say, yes, I want to do this. And I say, and here's the exact words I say, I say, okay, I will put your money to work just as soon as possible. And in fact, since you're a new private lender, I'm going to put you at the top of the queue. So the next deal I have, I'll put your money to work next. Now hmm. here comes the secret sauce. Maybe a week goes by, maybe two weeks goes by, maybe a month goes by. I call them up. I'm now going to give you the script, the exact script that I tell them when I call them up, when I've got a deal for them to fund. This is called the good news phone call, the good mm -hmm. news phone call. All right. All right? I'm not going to call them up and pitch a deal. They don't want to be pitched a deal. They want to put their money to work. So Justin, let's say you're one of my new private lenders and I pick up my phone here and I, and I call you up and we have like a little chit chat, you know, here's the script, Justin, I've got great news for you. I can now put your money to work. I got a house in Newport under contract with an after repaired value of $200,000. And the funding required for this deal is $150,000. By the way, I know you got $150,000 because you either already told me or you moved it over to the self-directed IRA company back to the yeah. script. Justin, I got great news for you. I can now put your money to work. I got a house in Newport under contract with an after repaired value of $200,000 and the funding required for the deal is $150,000. Closing is scheduled for next Wednesday. So you'll need to have your money wired to my real estate attorney. Uh, who's going to be doing the closing by next Tuesday. I'm going to have my real estate attorney email you the wiring instructions. That's the end of the conversation. The most stupid thing I could do is ask you if you want to fund the deal. Of course you want to fund the deal. Yeah, of course, you've been, of course. You, you've been waiting for the phone call mm -hmm. for me to put your money to work. And if you moved your money from your retirement funds over to the self-directed IRA company, you're not making any money until I put your money to work. I'm ethically bound to put your money to work because you moved it over at my recommendation. So mm -hmm. you're, you've been sitting by the phone waiting for your phone to ring for me to give you the good news phone call. Cause I told you two or three or four weeks ago, I was going to put your money to work for you. So you're waiting for the phone call. So we separate conversations of teaching the program what kind of interest rate you're going to earn all that kind of stuff mm -hmm. and then giving you the good news phone call that's it simple simple mm -hmm. simple there's no yeah. selling begging chasing it's all about serving yep that's super smart too especially when i think a common problem i see with friends with masterminds i'm in all that kind of stuff is people talk them out of the deal talk talk themselves out of the deal during that. Pitch. Well, and you're right. <laughs> that's one of the common mistakes that, that, a, that a new, uh, that an investor that's starting to use private money, they talk too much. <laughs> like, yep. you know, I mean, it's like all, I mean, the only thing that private lender wants to know is how much, to, I mean, notice I didn't give them the physical address. They could care less what the physical address is. They already know my geographical area that I'm investing in. They know I invest in Newport and Moorhead city and Beaufort and Havelock and Atlantic beach and Pine Oak shores, uh, and Emerald Isle, mm -hmm. <laughs> you yep. know, uh, and Swansboro, they already know that. So I'm just telling them simply what the deal is. And, you know, and, and you just said something, uh, Justin, that's very important that triggered me to, to say this, 
Mm-hmm. The worst time, the worst time to be looking for private money or to raise private money is when you need it. Yep. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> when you need it for a deal, right? Yep. Back, back to what I said, desperation's got a smell. Yep. It's just like hiring people. It's the worst time to hire somebody is when you need them. Like when you are Boy, desperate ain't that for that person. <laughs> That's, ain't that the truth? I've made that mistake more times than I care to admit. I finally learned from it. But uh, yeah, I mean, it's it's the... I've done it once where eh, it's probably more than once, honestly, if I think about it, but where we had a deal and we either didn't have enough capital lined up for it or funding fell through. And then we had to scramble to try and find it. And those conversations are 10 times harder versus oh, yeah. what you're saying, having, cause the lender I use in St. Louis, we did our first deal. And now I know like I've got availability to work with them as new deals come up and I don't really have to then go and pitch on the deal or, find the new lender for the deal to actually happen. So I, I love, right. so, you, so you're always kind of building these relationships with people as it's, yeah. as you're yeah. just going through your day-to-day life. Sure. And right. I mean, it's like, now that brings up a good point. How do you raise private money or when do you raise private money? Well, you're just having conversations as you're going through your life. Here, here's another writer downer. Ask yourself this question and make a list. Uh, like people say, well, who do I start talking to first or who do I bring it up to? Well, it's very simple. Who do you consistently see and where do you consistently see them every week? Mm-hmm. Where do you see people? I mean, mm-hmm. uh, like, uh, is it church? Uh, is it, uh, who do you play golf with? Where do you go to the grocery store? What restaurants do you go to? Well, why is that an important question? Because people are going to be private lenders for you that like and trust you, right? Mm -hmm. They're not investing in your deals. I mean, we're going to collateralize their promissory note and give them a deed of trust or a mortgage, of course. And we're going to name them as the mortgagee on the insurance policy. And we're going to protect them. But they're really not investing in your deals. They are investing in you is what Mm -hmm. they're doing. They're investing in you and they're putting their trust in you. Well, why don't you start with people that, you know, in your own network that already like you and trust you? I mean, it's like you don't have to start from scratch. Now, I practice and I teach how to grow your network very, very quickly, like overnight. Um, but, you know, that's that, that's a different topic. Start with the people where you've already got the trust yeah. uh, established. Well, and the cool thing, too, that I've noticed with the the minimal raising I've done, because it hasn't been a as much of a focus as it should be, but you, you'll be surprised at who will become a lender. Like there's, there's been a couple of people we've worked with where I'm like, I would have, have never had thought that you would have had the, you know, 200 grand sitting around to do this type of lending deal. Or, you know, I've had friends reach out to me that live in a different state now. And they're like, Hey, I've got 75 grand. Can you put that towards something? I'm like, Sure. I would not have known, you know, so you <laughs> never, never I mean, know who that person's going to be. You never want to prejudge. I've, I've mm-hmm. got, I've got one couple that are retired and both of them are school teachers from mm-hmm. Mississippi. One of the lowest paid states in the nation, as far as what teachers get paid, but they got $1,250,000 of retirement funds. They mm-hmm. never, they never touched their retirement and taught for over 30 years. Right. Mm-hmm. And so who would have thought two retired school teachers would have over a million dollars. Yeah. Don't prejudge yeah. anybody. So I mean, yeah. I've got this 16 minute audio that I recorded that I wrote and recorded the script and I, I titled it stress-free investing. And when I first started attracting private money, I shared that recording like popcorn, like I was just handing out candy you know, yeah. um, and not prejudge anybody. And, and here's what I did. I said, look, I've got a 16 minute audio here. Now we just text them the link, right? Um, mm-hmm. people don't even have CD players anymore, but anyway, <laughs> nope. the, 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 the purpose of that audio is to introduce <clears throat> private money and private lending and, you know, bring them into this world. And, 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 and the way I get, and the way I share that audio is I just tell them, I say, look, this 16 minute audio that I've recorded will show you how to get higher rates of return than you can probably get anywhere else. Take a listen to it. If it sounds interesting, I'll tell you more. That's it. There's mm-hmm. again, we're back to teaching. 
we're back to serving. We're back to sharing an opportunity with people. And I, I don't ever follow up with them. I mean, I, I let the 60 uh, minute audio, you know, do the work. And again, that's just going about your everyday life. Now, are there intentional things that we do to raise private money? Sure. We have private lender events, private lender luncheons where I'll feed people lunch and, and I'll teach again. I'll put on my teacher hat and I'll share my 20 minute PowerPoint presentation on what private money is and how the, what, how the program works. And, hmm. you know, I've raised $969,000 at one, one hour private lender luncheon where wow. I just put on my teacher hat and with not pitching any deals and just shared the program. So there's intentional activities to do and there, and then there's, you know, sharing as you're going out through your life, you know, how do you start conversations with a potential private lender? I love the next question for you. How do you, how you start <laughs> yeah. these conversations? How do you start the conversation? I love, did you know questions? Did you know? So one of my favorite, did you know questions is, Hey, you know, I'm, I'm having lunch or whatever. I'm, you know, I'm at a social gathering and I'll say, by the way, did you know there's a way people can make unlimited money per year tax free? They're not going to know the answer to that question. They're going to say, no, I mean, you just got their attention. Yeah, uh, with yeah. how, so how can somebody earn unlimited money per year tax free? Well, of course, I'm talking about somebody having a Roth IRA at a self-directed IRA company. And, and so when they say, I mean, even a financial planner ain't going to know the answer to that question. And, uh, and my follow-up question is I'll say, well, have you ever heard of self-directed IRA companies in all likelihood they haven't. And so now I'm going to tell them about the company that I recommend that over half of my private lenders, over 50% of my 47 private lenders have transferred their retirement money over to the self-directed IRA company. And now they're earning either tax deferred or tax free money. So mm -hmm. I come in the back door talking about self-directed IRAs. And the reason that's such an easy conversation is because whoever you're talking to 99% of them ain't never heard of it. Mm -mm. Yeah. No. And it's I, one thing I've noticed for me, doing real estate investing, I just assume everybody knows this stuff, right? That they've heard of these things. And then once I like step back away from, you know, my circle of people that I always talk to and talk to family members or friends that are, you know, in a W2 job or they do something different, like a lot of the terminology we hear on a day-to-day -day basis, 99% of people have no clue what we're talking about. So nope, I think that's a, a very so, easy I mean, trap right, to so get in. You, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's like when you, when you bring up these topics, you are really bringing value to the conversation because mm -hmm. you're sharing information with them that they never heard about. And, and it could be valuable to them and people that they know. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, oh, just absolutely. think this podcast, Justin, on how many times we've gotten just new information, just being on this, just us, you know? Oh yeah, dude. I've learned so much. Like I'll it, just it, like this conversation. Just learn. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, sure. We, we always, uh, we always, you know, tell our audience this isn't about Justin and I at all. It's about you know the value that you guys are bringing for sure. Um, because like I haven't heard of this before, and I'm just soaking it in. You know. Well, absolutely. It's, it's, it's funny too because like I I know a little bit about self directed IRAs, but I didn't. I don't think I realized the correlation of being able to move your retirement right. accounts over to that to then be able to use for investments. But I know people that do it. But it's like it's almost like that correlation wasn't made for yeah. me before, you know? Yeah. Well, the reason that, that the reason that is so important is because over half of my private, I'll, I'll give you a couple of statistics. So over 50% of my private lenders are using their retirement funds hmm. to yeah. invest in our deals. Uh, and they're earning tax deferred or tax free money. Now, if I didn't know about self-directed IRAs, if I didn't have a relationship with a person at the self-directed IRA company that I that I have all my private lenders put their retirement funds in, I, I'd be missing out on over half of my mm. funding. Yeah. I'd, I'd be missing out on over half of my funding because that's the funding they're using. Now, here's an interesting statistic. Over 70% of people that have accounts at self-directed IRA companies want to be a private lender. 
and they want to loan you money. Hmm. However, so what's the takeaway from that? Well, go to networking events at self-directed IRA companies. However, the dynamic and the conversation is very different. You see, now that's going to be a negotiation conversation because they already know what a private lender is. Right. They're already accustomed to getting what they are accustomed to getting. Whereas when you put on your teacher hat, you get to make the rules. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That's a great point. Are you, getting, are you getting referrals from your private money lenders for other private money lenders? Absolutely. Like yeah. Absolutely. I mean, I got a ton of private lenders I've never met. I've talked to them over the phone a lot, mm -hmm. but I mean, I've got, uh, I got one couple that live in Tennessee. Uh, they've got right at a million dollars with me. I've never met them in person. They were referred mm -hmm. uh, to me from another private lender. And, um, I've got nieces and nephews that have parents and grandparents that I've never met that are private lenders with us. Um, and so, you know, it, it just, it just, and you don't even have to ask for referrals. It automatically happens. Right. I mean, you know, I've been paying my private lenders the same thing, 8%, no points since 2009. And, uh, one question I've gotten in recent uh, times is they'll say, Jay, how in the world, how in the world are you paying your private lenders the same thing that you've been paying them since 2009 no. and interest and interest rates have gone up the, out the roof. I said, well, there's two answers to that question. Number one, I make the rules and they don't. <laughs> number two, <laughs> number two is, you know, prior to COVID, the 12 month certificate of deposit average got down to 0.17%. Hmm. Right now you can go to first citizens bank here on Bridges street in Moorhead city, and you can get uh, a 12 month uh, APR on a, on a certificate of deposit for four and a half percent. Well, that's a big difference. 0 0.17 to four and a half percent. But guess what? I pay my private lenders 8%. That's still a whole lot more than four and a half percent. So they love me twice as much as they do the bank. Mm -hmm. Now that, that's a great point. Cause the, the lender I have here that we work with locally, they're in the, the finance world. They're in the, sure. the lending world. So they already understand like for them, uh, the, the spouse of the person that, that we do this with, she owns a financial wealth firm. So it's like, mm -hmm. It, that that's where this was more of a negotiation with them of you know sure. what makes sense for you what makes sense for us kind of thing I all like right justin way. i'm gonna put you on the spot i'm gonna put okay. you on the spot okay i'm gonna put all you right. on the spot in front in front of god and everybody right now <laughs> let's do it how much do you pay your private lender first of all what interest rate do you pay your private lender so right now they're at 12 percent. well i'm not jesus christ but i'm gonna set you free okay <laughs> <laughs> well, would you rather pay 8% or 12%? I know the answer to pay 8%. Yeah. Do you pay your private lender points or origination fees? No origination fees. The we've got some unique situations with them where one deal was like an emergency funding one, so we're JVing that one and splitting with them. Um, okay. Where normally the other loan that we have out with them right now, if we have money out more than 6 months, then we're paying points. Ugh. See yeah. the, 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 the length, the length of my note is either two years or five years. Hmm. And hmm. The, the truth, the truth of the matter is my private lenders, they don't want the money back because if they get the money back, they're not making any money on their yeah. money. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> right? So, and there's no extension fees, right? So all my hmm. notes are either two years long or five years long. Now, the reason I do the five year, I mean, I'm not going to use money for five years. I used to do, I used to sell a lot of houses on rent to own or lease purchase. And if they were using retirement funds, I'd do a note for five years. Cause that would give me plenty of time to help the buyer of the, of the house, get their credit cleaned up and, and help them get ready for a yeah. mortgage. Uh, in today's market, I'm not doing much of that anymore unless I buy on terms. I buy on terms, I'll typically sell on terms, but mm -hmm. most of the deals I'm doing today, I'm just paying cash for private money, but then I'll do a two year term. Um, if, if, if it's just investment capital and not retirement funds that the lender's huh. using, 
And the reason I do two years, I'm typically not going to have that note for two years, but if I've got a major rehab, that's going to be 70 or $80,000. And if my contractors can't get to it for 90 days because they're backed up, I just don't want to put myself in a corner and have to do an extension. If I haven't cashed out, you know, within a year I've done that <laughs> right? And it, and it wasn't fun. <laughs> <laughs> right, exactly. No. And so, you know, again, I mean, 8%, I mean, regular people walking around absolutely love 8%. Now, I do pay 10% if they're in a junior position. I don't have to, but that's just the way I put the program together. I never pay origination fees, but I pay 10% on smaller amounts of money that I use maybe for rehabbing a property and not purchasing okay. a property. And the reason I pay them 10% is because, as we know, a junior position is at higher risk than a first position, because even though I give them a deed of trust and they can foreclose, then they would have to inherit the first position note in mm -hmm. order to be, you know, to be made whole. So I give them a higher rate, it's not because they're asking for needed. it, yeah. but that's just the way I structured the program. So, I mean, the thing of it is, Raising and attracting private money is really, really easy and simple if you understand the scripting and if you've got the right mindset and you've got your program put together that you're teaching people. I say just duplicate my program. It seems to work pretty good. Sounds like it. Yeah. I'm going to have to come hang out with you more than, than our, our hour here. So, you know, well, I tell you, you how you can you hang out with me more than soon. this hour, and your audience can. Can we, can we tell your audience uh, about what I'm so excited yeah, about? Absolutely. And that's my brand new seven day private money challenge. Yeah, yeah absolutely. All right. So I here's what it, it is I, I just recorded uh, this challenge. It's seven days. Uh, each video training is only 15 to 20 minutes long. So it's not, you know, going to take a lot of time, it's very digestible very consumable. And so when someone enrolls in the private money challenge, then immediately they get the very first video training, the first one of the seven days. And then at 10 AM Eastern time, the next six days, they get the next 15 to 20 minute video trainings. And so we have a lot of fun. I give homework to do, and it's just very simple step-by-step how to start attracting and raising private money for your real estate deals. And here's a simple way to enroll. All you got to do is pick up your cell phone and you want to type in the word challenge, just type in the word challenge and text it to this number five, eight, 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 five. That's all you got to do. Type the word challenge text it to five, eight, 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 five. And then I'll automatically reply to you with the website. You can go right there and enroll. And I promise you, you'll learn how to raise private money. I'll give you the scripting and how to make your list and all that. And on top of that, I promise you we'll have a lot of fun too. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. No, that's great. That's, I mean, for those of you who are listening to this, we're 48 minutes into this and I've got a ton of value out of this call already. But Absolutely. you're going to get 15 to 20 minutes a day for a week of even more value. So make sure you guys text. I'm going to text and join as soon as we're done here, just because I'm super curious what you've got in there. Um, yeah, this this is awesome, though. Um, Vince, did you have any any other questions on your end for Jay? That I'm no, I, I, this is, yeah, th no, this has been awesome. Like, I'm just uh, I'm thinking of all the, the social media reels that are going to come from this. I think people are truly going to eat it up. Um, this is something that I know tons and tons and tons of people just have questions about and, you mm -hmm. know, like I, for one, <clears throat> haven't gotten into this space yet. Um, you know, I'm newer to the investing side of things. And so my partner and I are, you know, doing more wholesaling so that we can get more capital <laughs> within our business at the moment. And, you know, we've, um, kind of reverse engineered. Justin, and started... I think Benny's froze up on us. <laughs> oh, I'm, am, I, am I gone? No, you're, you're back, you're back now. now. You're back now. Oh. Yeah. Uh, I don't but even know what I, I heard where, was something you're, you and your uh, partner are doing. Yeah. So like we're, you know, we haven't really gotten into this space yet because right now we've been doing more wholesaling, <laughs> just generating capital. <laughs> you're going to have a cover for Vinny, Justin. <laughs> I know. <That's> so weird. <laughs> 
I know you're freezing right when yeah. you explain what you're about to say, too. Oh, like, yeah. Right. At Overall, the Jay, the, the great, great conversation. <laughs> <laughs> we'll end this part at the end. Hey, Vince, uh, you know how to put a bow on it when you need to put a bow on it. That's yeah, true. Yeah. Yeah. I got I got five kids here. and They're probably on all, all on a device. And that's what's causing <laughs> my stuff to be uh, a little bit slow. E eating up all your Internet bandwidth. I get that. Yeah. yeah. Well, cool. Jay, thank you so much for coming on. It was great. I know I've I've seen you around and it's nice to finally actually meet you and talk in person on this, but really appreciate you coming up and providing a ton of value for, for everyone. Absolutely. Listening. Well, that's my joy. That's my passion. Uh, Justin Vince, thank you all so much for having me come along and let me talk about my favorite subject, private money that yeah. I'm so passionate about. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. I'm going to be taking taking some stuff from this and, and improving my my private money game. So I really appreciate it, man. Hey, I want you to reach out to me when you got your first private lender that is ecstatic to be uh, getting paid 8% instead of 12%. Okay. All right. I could do that. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Thank you awesome. guys for having me. God bless you. All right. See thanks, you. Jay. 